Well, this evening I'm going to have to begin by reading the text since I didn't have the opportunity to read it earlier. So let me read for you now Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 14, and this is where we're going to focus uh, this evening. So beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of um, Iturea and Trichonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every ravine will be filled, and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight, and the rough roads smooth and all flesh will see the salvation of God. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees, so every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds were questioning him, saying, Then what shall we do? And he would answer and say to them, The man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and he who has food is to do likewise. And some tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what you have been ordered to. Some soldiers were questioning him, saying, and what about us? What shall we do? And he said to them, do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. <clears throat> well, there's a lot in, in these uh, verses this evening. And we're not going to be able to look at everything in exhaustive detail, as I said earlier, but hopefully we'll get uh, at least a main idea of what's going on here. Now, just again by way of review, this morning we saw that glimpse that Luke gave to us into Jesus' childhood. We knew certain things about him, but here we saw certain things that Jesus actually did as a 12-year-old uh, a preteen, and as I pointed out uh, this morning, if you've raised children, you know that preteen is, is kind of a precarious time, at least for ordinary children. But for Jesus, he was, of course, committed to loving and serving his father. We saw his trip to Jerusalem with his parents for the Passover. And again, children were not required to go to the Passover, but Jesus went, perhaps because his parents were training him in godliness and the right way to be with God's people when they meet together for worship as the Lord has called them to, certainly Jesus wanted to be there to show his love to his Father and to worship him. We saw his staying behind in the temple to learn more from the teachers of Israel after the feast was over, again showing us that you know Jesus wasn't there to instruct these teachers, but rather he was there to be instructed by them because he wanted to better understand his father's will in order that he might carry it out. And then we saw his trip back to Nazareth where he continued under subjection to his parents, essentially carrying out what it is he knew of his father's will towards his parents because he loved him and wanted to please him. And again, it was in Nazareth he would continue to grow in preparation for the mission his father had sent him into the world uh, to do. He continued to grow in stature. He grew up to maturity. And, of course, he also grew in favor with God and with man. Jesus, as the eternal Son of God, was always perfectly and infinitely pleasing to his father. But as a man, he also pleased him by being the man he wanted him to be. And, again, Jesus is our example. Now, this evening, we move forward in time about 18 years to the beginning of John's ministry, which was to prepare God's people to receive Jesus. And essentially, what I want us to see are four things in our passage. I want us, first of all, to see 
John's call. Secondly, where his ministry took place. We might say even to a degree why it took place there. How his call fulfilled God's promise um, that we read about that's quoted here from Isaiah. And we want to see something of the character of his ministry, which I think is the most important thing for us to see this evening. Now, first of all, we see John's call. Uh, notice that Luke again gives us this, uh, this sort of barrage of, uh, of historic details to help us locate in time uh, where this event took place, when this, uh, this event took place. This, this is not just simply once upon a time, there was a place where something happened. These events took place in real time and space history. It took place during the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar's reign when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee. Now, the idea of tetrarch might be unfamiliar to us, but it essentially means that they were ruling over one quarter of something. And that something was the area that Herod the Great actually ruled over, uh, that Herod that tried to have Jesus put to death. When Herod the Great died, his kingdom was divided into four sections. One of them went to his son, Herod Antipas. You know, sometimes uh, as we read the Bible, we can get a little bit confused about who this Herod is and that Herod. Well, this particular Herod is the Herod that is going to arrest John. Now, another portion of Herod the Great's kingdom went to his son, Philip. And this is the Philip who was married to Herodias, and Herodias, you know, is the one who left Philip in order to marry his brother, Herod Antipas, and it's for this that John is going to call him to account, and for this that John is going to be arrested. Now, again, this list of foreigners reminds us that the Jews were a conquered people. They were under the domination of a world empire, essentially Rome. Uh, they were under that kingdom that was represented in Nebuchadnezzar's dream that I referred to in, in the prayer. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar had the dream, and, and he uh, required that someone come to him and tell him what the dream was and explain it to him, and Daniel was the one who did. But the dream was with, of this great statue of, of various metals, and down at the base of the statue was, were feet that were essentially made of iron mixed with clay, and how that, uh, that particular kingdom that was represented by those feet is the kingdom that was then in existence. But it was at the time of that kingdom that the Lord was going to set up His kingdom. Remember the stone cut without hands that crushes the feet of the statue and it topples over and it basically is crushed into powder. The wind comes and blows it all away. And then that stone cut without hand grows into a great mountain that fills the whole earth. Well, Rome was then in power. Uh, that's what we see from all these foreigners ruling over, uh, over the, the Jews. But our Lord Jesus Christ was coming in order to set up his kingdom that would put an end to that kingdom and eventually fill the whole earth. Now, we also see that this was the time of the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. And this is a little bit strange because there is usually only one high priest at any one time. But during the, uh, the, the ministry of John and, and Jesus, there are actually two. And sometimes you wonder, well, who exactly was the high priest in those days? Well, Annas was until he was deposed by the Romans from his office. And then Caiaphas, who succeeded him, married um, Annas' daughter and then made Annas his deputy so that both of them are called high priests in those days. So again, gives us a little bit of understanding of why there's two high priests. But the most important thing to note here that it was at this time that the word of the Lord came to John while he was in the wilderness. When we last heard about John in basically in Luke chapter 1, verse 80, Luke had told us that John continued to grow and be, to become strong in spirit. And he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Remember being girded in the clothing of a, uh, of a prophet, eating locusts and wild honey, pretty, um, you know, sort of a Spartan kind of a diet. He uh, almost sounds like a little bit of an eccentric, uh, but that's the way prophets were. And he was in the deserts, as it were, preparing for this ministry, uh, 
But that day had finally come, and the Lord, or excuse me, uh, well, I should say the Lord through Luke describes his calling. Now, a couple of things to note here. The calling is, is very reminiscent of the way the Lord called the Old Testament prophets. In verse 2, we read, the word of the Lord came to John. Now, it's interesting that that phrase is used over and over again in the Old Testament when the Lord would, would call one of his Old Testament prophets. This is the way it was described. And this is the only time that this phrase is used in the New Testament at all, perhaps because John was the last of the Old Covenant prophets who was sent to announce the arrival of the prophet that all of these Old Testament prophets were essentially pointing to not only through their prophecies, but also through their office. The office of prophet was essentially a type of the one who was coming, and that is the great prophet who would declare to us the will of God for our salvation. Another thing to notice here is that John was now 30 years old. Now, we know this because he was conceived six months before Jesus, and Jesus was about to begin his ministry And we're told by Luke in Luke, well, actually in verse 23 of this chapter, that Jesus was 30 years old when he did so. Now, this is the age that John, if he had followed the vocation that was actually uh, to be his uh, because of of basically the line he was born in. Remember, he's Zacharias, the priest's son. John would have become a priest if he had not been called to be a prophet. This is an unusual. I think we've seen this happen also in the Old Testament. But this is the age at which he would enter into the office of being a priest. Uh, and it's interesting that, John, that Jesus begins his ministry at the same time. Now, those who served in the office of priests would serve from age 30, when I think essentially they're mature enough not to do something foolish in the temple that would basically culminate in their death till age 50 when they would retire. John's going to begin his ministry at 30, but we are going to see that his is going to be cut considerably shorter uh, than 20 years. Now, secondly, we see where this ministry takes place. We read in verse 3 that he came into all the district around the Jordan. Sometimes John was at Bethany, Uh, which was, um, it's called Bethany beyond the Jordan, not the same Bethany that Jesus would go to when he would retire from Jerusalem that was close to the Mount of Olives. There was more than one Bethany. And this particular one was on the east side of the Jordan, essentially outside of the promised land in, in certain senses. And sometimes he was baptizing at Anon, which was near Salem, on the west side. Now, the thing to note here is that he's standing in the Jordan. I mean, this is where he's, his ministry is, out in the wilderness, near the Jordan, actually around the Jordan. Why the Jordan River? Well, because there's water there, and, and his ministry was the ministry of baptism. But there was water in other places that he could have done this. It's interesting that it was here at the Jordan River, remember, that God originally brought his people into the promised land And essentially, their sins in the promised land caused them to be expelled from the land and they were taken into exile. And then they came back into the land. Essentially, the Jews had become somewhat rebellious again. And I think the location of where John was baptizing, the Lord was sending them a message. And the message was repentance, trying to call them back again to faithfulness. As you entered into this land according to the promise of God, and you did so because you believed him. You believed he was able to bring you in. You need to, again, renew that repentance and renew that faith. I think another thing that's interesting here is that when John was out in the wilderness and basically fairly far away from, you know, the cities and the towns, that people were coming out to him in order to hear him. Usually, you know, you had to go to people in order to get an audience. Uh, even Jesus would go to those cities and he would preach. And sometimes, of course, people would follow him into the wilderness. But when he sent his disciples out, they would go to the various towns to preach. But the people were coming out to him. We read in Matthew 3, verse 5, Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea, and all the district around the Jordan. You see, word was getting out that the Lord had 
raised up another prophet, that the 400 years of silence was being broken. Now, we, we, we know it was broken earlier when the angel came and announced to Zacharias that John was going to be born, but that was fairly private. And then when the angel goes to Mary and announces that she's going to conceive and bear a son as a virgin, that was fairly private. Or when he was born and the angels came and spoke to the shepherds, that was fairly private. Uh, the silence had been broken, but now it's really broken. God raises up another prophet to begin to declare the word of God, and the people wanted to hear what it is he had to say, what this was all about. These were exciting times for the Jews. They didn't have television. <laughs> so, I mean, these were things that, that got their attention, right? And we also need to be careful that we don't get so wrapped up in our entertainments that we miss what the Lord is actually doing around us because he's continuing to work today. Now, thirdly, we see how his ministry fulfilled what God had promised many years ago regarding the forerunner of the Messiah. John came preaching that the Jews should repent, that they should turn away from their sins. Repentance, remember, means not just a change of mind. It means a change of life. It means a change of direction. It means you're going one way, which is wrong, and you need to turn around and go the right way, okay? You're breaking God's law. You need to stop breaking the law and begin obeying the Lord. That's what repentance is all about. So he was preaching that they should repent, and he was also baptizing them with a baptism of repentance, a baptism that, by their submitting to it, would show that they were sincere about their repentance. They really wanted to change. This is not the same baptism that Jesus instituted or would institute, because those that were baptized by John would need to be baptized again when they received Jesus. But this was a baptism that was meant to lead them to forgiveness. Okay, now they were being, uh, what is the terminology that was um, used here? There was a, a, a baptism <clears throat> of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This doesn't mean that this baptism was actually going to save them. But what it does mean is it would prepare them to receive Jesus, okay? The only one who can take away our sins. Now, that's what the Lord had raised up John to do. That's what he sent him into the world to do. That is what he had said through Isaiah the prophet so many centuries before that he would do when he came into the world preaching with the spirit and power of Elijah the prophet, again, who was a very fiery prophet. We read in uh, Luke chapter uh, 3, verses 4 through 6, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and this is what he says, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every ravine will be filled, and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight, and the rough roads smooth, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. John is the fulfillment of this. Now, what does this prophecy actually mean? Well, we know that, that much of this is symbolic because the ravines weren't, weren't filled and the mountains weren't leveled, but there is a correlation <clears throat> between John's ministry and what was actually happening in the hearts of God people. John is the voice crying in the wilderness. That, that part of it is clear. And his message was that the way of the Lord might be made in their hearts, his paths straight. In other words, that their hearts might be prepared to receive Jesus when he comes, that he might have direct access to their hearts. The fact that every ravine might be fulfilled is referring to that, that those who would receive him, those who were downcast might be lifted up. Every mountain and hill being brought low meant that those who would receive him would humble themselves. The, the prideful, the proud, would have to humble themselves in order to receive him. That the crooked would become straight means that those who were living in sin would have to repent and begin to live a godly life. Remember, the, the ways of the Lord are straight and they are not crooked. And then the rough roads becoming smooth might have reference to the fact that the Jews had so speckled the road with obstacles. Remember the obstacles of, of legalism. You know, do this and you will live rather than the principle of grace. John the Baptist is pointing them to the one who is going to uh, 
give them salvation as a free gift, that it would be purely of grace. The rough roads would be made smooth in order that they might come to the Lord. And then he says, all flesh, the Jews first, but also the Gentiles, would see the salvation of God, the salvation from sin and judgment that he has provided in his son who is coming after him. Now, again, as we consider the ministry of John the Baptist, we see that this is the effect that it had on those who heard him. In some, it was only temporary because it was generated perhaps by the, uh, the force of his preaching, by his charisma. We know that people are able to talk other people into doing things, you know, into changing their lives for a certain period of time. But it's only when the Spirit of God accompanies the Word of God that a permanent change is made, and those who heard by the power of the Holy Spirit had that change, and they received Jesus when he came. Now, finally, and most importantly, I think we see the character of his ministry, how this call worked itself out in his preaching. And I think here's where this passage becomes particularly applicable uh, to each one of us here in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, first of all, uh, we are called to do the same kind of work, although not to the extent that John did it. And certainly not, if we don't have the gifts, we can't do that in the way he did it. But we have that call. And secondly, um, this is applicable to us because what he is preaching here has to be true of us if we are to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we've been reminded a number of times of late, Mark Bube, when he came and did the Foreign Missions Conference, Dennis Rowe, when he was here, he was, he was reminding us of this very thing, that the work of the Great Commission has been entrusted to us for this generation. You know, it's not a work for someone else to do. We are all to be involved in it at some level. And that means communicating the gospel with other people. Now, there's certainly a sense, or at least a part of that presentation, that connects us to the work of John the Baptist. We need to be able to do what he did. We need to communicate this kind of message uh, to, to others in order to prepare them as well to receive the Lord Jesus before we offer Jesus to them. Now, that isn't uh, real popular to do today, especially when we see the implications of what that means. I mean, we need to call people out and, and tell them that they're, they're sinners, that they need Jesus Christ. But unless we do that, unless they see their need of Jesus, it's just going to go over their heads. You know, remember the illustration of the, the life preserver. If, if in this room somebody threw you a lifesaver, you know, one of those, I mean, not a candy, you know, but that thing that's on the ship that allows you to float if you can't swim. Um, if someone threw you to, that to you in this room, you would probably look at them and say, why do I need this? You know, I'm perfectly safe. Uh, but if, you, if that person were drowning and you threw it to them, then they would immediately see their need of it and grab onto it. Well, how can we offer somebody a lifesaver unless they first understand the danger that they're in? That's exactly what John the Baptist was doing. This is a part of that planting and watering that uh, Paul says that, um, that he did and Apollos did uh, to the Corinthians. So what is it that we should be doing? What is it that, that John did? Well, first of all, he told his audience the truth about themselves. And the truth is not flattering. I mean, listen to what he says. This is not exactly the way to win friends and influence people. But this is the message God used to open their hearts to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. We read in verse 7. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, we need to just step back for a moment and try to understand what it is that, that's going on here. Now, Matthew tells us that when John said this, that he actually directed this statement to a specific group of people that came out, not just to everyone, and it was to the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who came out to hear him. But we do need to understand at the same time, and by the way, they were hypocrites and they needed to hear this, okay? They were the, they were the teachers of Israel but they were rejecting God's word. But there is a real sense in which what he says here certainly applies to everyone, doesn't it? It applied to us as we came into the world. We, were, we didn't come into the world sweet and innocent. We came into the world as, 
the brood of vipers are the offspring of serpents. Uh, we were the children of the devil. That was our condition. Paul tells us in Rome, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he says in Romans 5.18, through one transgression, Adam's sin, there resulted condemnation to all men. We all came into the world dead in our sins, deserving of God's wrath, of being buried in hell forever. That is the way we entered into the world. That is true of each one of us. Now, the question is, is that the message that we need to communicate to the people who are around us? Now, we do in a certain sense, even though we might not use this exact language, when we're talking to our neighbors about their need of Jesus Christ. One thing we need to bear in mind is the context. I mean, who was it that John was actually speaking to here? He wasn't speaking to Gentiles who were in darkness and didn't know anything. Remember how uh, God spoke to Jonah about the Ninevites and how they didn't know the difference between their right hand and their left. They hadn't been taught. They didn't know the truth and, and how he should be merciful to them and how the Lord wanted to show mercy to them even though they were a wicked people, right? Well, that's not who John was speaking to. He was speaking to the church, okay? These are the Old Testament people of God, a people who had been raised in the truth, a people who had the mark of God's covenant on them, but a people who had not been living according to God's will. That's the reason why the Sadducees and the Pharisees were even more culpable and why John and Jesus used such strong language against them. The Lord reminds us to whom much is given, much is required. They had been given much, and so the rebuke is going to be much stronger. Now, for the most part, our audience, the ones we're going to, have not heard the truth. They are like the Ninevites that Jonah was preaching to. They're like the Gentiles that Paul was going out to, and so our approach will be perhaps more along the lines of what the Apostle Paul preached to the Gentiles. Again, um, People need to understand that they are God's enemies. They need to understand they're in danger of His judgment. They need to understand that they need to flee from that wrath to Jesus in order to escape it. But the way that we bring it across is going to be with more mercy and with greater gentleness. But we need to get that point across. Paul certainly did that as well. Now, secondly, John told them that if their repentance was genuine, if it was sincere that it would make a difference in the way they lived. That's what repentance means. Not just changing my mind about whether this is right or wrong, but seeing that I'm doing that, that wrong to begin to do what is right. That is repentance, something that is required. Now, what does that look like? John told them in verses 10 through 14. He gave several examples. Let me read uh, these verses again. Beginning in verse 10, the crowds are questioning him, saying, then what shall we do? And he would answer and say to them, the man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and he who has food is to do likewise. You've been selfish, repent of your selfishness. You see your neighbor in need, don't just say be warm and be filled, but actually do something to meet that need. And some tax collectors also came to be baptized and they said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what you have been ordered to. Remember, some of the tax collectors were collecting taxes for Rome, but they were taking a little bit extra for themselves. In other words, don't extort money from others, but do your job. It was okay for them to collect taxes because taxes support the government, and the government is ordained by God. Even the ones that, that are without God were ordained by Him. Taxes are what we owe to them. So pay the, pay the tax or collect the taxes but don't steal from them. And then the same thing essentially with the soldiers. Some soldiers were questioning him, saying, and what about us? What shall we do? And he said to them, do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. Do the right thing. Stop doing the wrong thing. Stop sinning and begin doing what is right. <clears throat> so again, repentance, turning from sin into the path of righteousness. Essentially, repentance means a turning around. You're going the wrong direction. Turn around and begin going the right direction. And what is the right direction? It's the direction God 
tells us in His Word. Now, John further warned them that their family and their church connection wasn't going to be enough to save them. He says in verse 8, And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. You know, a lot of Jews, uh, the Jews essentially believed they were going to be saved because of their connection to Abraham. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The connection to Abraham and to the covenant because they're the children of Abraham was not going to be enough. God could fulfill his promise to Abraham that, you know, he was going to give him numerous seed. Uh, even without that generation, even if they were all destroyed in God's judgment, he made Adam from the dust of the ground. He could just as easily raise up children to Abraham from these stones. <clears throat> we need to, uh, in the same way, tell those that we minister to, and, and there are some who actually believe this, that being raised in a Christian household is not enough. Being a member of, of a Bible-believing church isn't enough. Some believe that we're all going to be saved, so if you're a part of the human race, you're going to go to heaven, but being a part of the human race is not enough. You must repent. You must believe. And that's what we need to communicate. And then finally, John told them that their time was running out. Okay, they weren't going to have forever to do this. Time is drawing near. Verse 9. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, what John meant by that is, remember, he's the forerunner of the Messiah. Messiah is coming after him. He's just getting the people ready. The Lord was about to come, and when he did, he was going to thoroughly clear his threshing floor, okay? He was going to sort through his people, through the preaching of the gospel. He was going to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he was going to burn up with unquenchable fire. That being the case, he says, you need to get ready. Now, how could they know whether or not they were ready? Well, again, every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. If they were bearing good fruit, if they were believing and repenting, and remember, repenting means more than just turning from sin. It means moving in the path of righteousness. It means bearing good fruit. It means serving the Lord and doing His will. If that's what they were doing, they didn't have to worry. They were going to stand, okay? But if they would not repent, they would be thrown into the fire. Repentance is essential to our salvation. We don't earn our salvation by repenting, but if we're trusting in Jesus Christ, if we have His Spirit in our hearts, we will be repenting. We will live the life He calls us to live, not perfectly. We're going to fail every day, but that's our desire, and we will be making progress. Again, it's not enough just to want it. We will actually be doing it. Now, Jesus may or may not be ready to appear today. There are those who believe He may come at any time. Certainly, those in many denominations, many in our denomination, believe He could come at any time. There are those who believe it is coming is yet a ways off, okay? But we do know that eventually we're going to have to die and stand before Him. And that's going to come perhaps much sooner. Now, we need to warn our neighbor as well that time is running out, Today is the day of salvation, but if they put it off, tomorrow they may perish. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We don't know when time runs out. We don't know when we're going to have to stand before the Lord, so we need to warn them they will not always have time to repent and believe. They need to act on it immediately. Now, as I said, there's two things we can learn from this. The other is this, and in closing, I just want us to think about it for a moment. This, this message that John preached certainly applies to us as well, doesn't it? If we're going to stand before the Lord on the day of His judgment, we need to make sure that our hope is a sound hope, that we're not just simply trusting our relationship to our parents, we're not trusting our upbringing, we're not trusting our membership within the church, we're not trusting in the idea of a universal salvation that we're all going to the same place and we're all going to arrive there eventually in order to save us. If we are going to be ready for that day, we need to do 
what God tells us to do in His Word. We need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust Him alone for our salvation. But we also need to follow Him. Our following Him does not earn us salvation. Our following Him is simply the evidence that we have been saved. We need to be turning from our sins and living as He calls us to live. We need to be trees that are bearing good fruit. If we don't do that, that acts that will be laid at the root of the, those trees will be laid at our root, and we will be cast into the fire if we're not re repenting and believing, right? But if we do repent and believe, that acts will never come near us, okay, because we are safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We do need to be careful that when we read the Scriptures that, that we do apply these things to ourselves. You know, we're always quick to kind of apply them to someone else. And these certainly do apply to others, but they do apply to us as well. So we need to hear this message that John is preaching of repentance. And if we would see heaven, we do need to turn from our sins, not just from 9 out of 10 or 99 out of 100. We need to turn from all of them because if, if we are embracing and loving any sin and cherishing that sin, then we are not hating sin as our Lord calls us to hate sin because if we hate sin, we'll hate every sin. And if we don't, if there's one sin we don't hate, then it's not sin that we hate, okay? It's rather the consequences of what those things might mean for us. Repentance is universal or it is really no repentance at all. So may the Lord encourage us to examine our own lives as we read about this, as we see what John had to preach, to make sure that we are by God's grace, and we can only do this by God's grace, turning from our sins and seeking to put on the Lord Jesus Christ in every area of our lives. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask for God's grace uh, to be able to do this.